Let's begin with 2 Corinthians 5.21, which says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And this is the most concise and clear Bible verse which we have on Christ's substitutionary atonement. So let's look at that again. For he, speaking of God, hath made him, speaking of Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, Jesus had no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is speaking about him taking, Jesus taking our place, which is why this verse in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 is the most concise Bible verse on this doctrine. Now, there are various aspects of the gospel that we can cover, such as the blood atonement or the issue of repentance or everlasting life. But I specifically want to focus in today on the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. And there are three reasons for that. First, because the substitutionary atonement is the heart of the gospel message. It answers how and why we are able to be saved. The second reason is because it's very important for us as laborers of the harvest to adequately understand the substitutionary atonement or the substitutionary aspect of the gospel so that we can clearly explain it to others when we go out there and we preach the gospel to the lost. And there are numerous theories out there, but we're going to focus on two of them, which have gained the most momentum historically. The first is what we believe in this church, which basically states that Jesus died instead of us, and that he stood in our stead before a just and mighty God. And um, that's, that's, the main, that's the main doctrine of the substitutionary atonement. But there's also a false teaching out there called the ransom theory of atonement, which asserts that Jesus didn't die to assuage God's wrath, but that Jesus shed his blood as a ransom to the devil, who allegedly holds a claim to man's soul as a consequence of the fall. Now, it's a very strange doctrine, and I'm going to refute the ransom to the devil theory today, among the other things that we're going to look at. Now, some people say, doesn't God, um, isn't God cruel, you know, to actually kill an innocent life? Doesn't that make God a cruel and bloodthirsty God who required the innocent life of a man to be killed on behalf of the guilty? These are the type of questions that we run across. And the fact is, that's a straw man argument because God gave his own life by becoming flesh and taking upon himself the penalty of our sins. It was a self-sacrificial act that he freely chose to, to put upon himself. John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did for us. He laid down his life for our life and called us his friends. So God, the creator, calls us friends by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, when we go out to preach the gospel to the lost, if people are willing to listen and give us enough time, we explain all the major components of the gospel, including first, how that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and that there is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. That means there's not one good person that's alive during this, this time on earth. Number two, how that because God is holy, perfect, and just, and how that is a result of our fall, we are imperfect, unholy, and unrighteous because of our sin. And as such, the wages of our sin is both the physical death, which is the first death, and the second death, which is the lake of fire and hell, Romans 6.23 and Revelation 21.8. So I'm taking you through the basics of the gospel, what we preach when we go out there so that you have a more comprehensive view of our doctrines. Number three, but because of God's great love for us, 
Romans 5.24, God himself provided a way for man as an act of his infinite mercy and perpetual grace to those who receive him. And that distinction of those who receive him is critical because some think that the fact that Jesus died for everyone leads to universalism, the belief that all will be saved. But there is only one condition to salvation because all will not be saved. In fact, the Bible says that most people will not be saved and there are few people that will make it to heaven. And so that distinction is important and there is only one condition of salvation, which is belief. In order to be saved, you have to willingly receive Christ's free gift through faith alone. Number four, we explain that salvation is a free gift, a gift of God, and that it is not to be attained by the works of the law, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Salvation is nothing that we can earn, work for, accomplish, maintain, lose, or keep by our own efforts. It's expressly the work of God in sanctification through the Holy Spirit once received. And so once we have everlasting life, which, which the Bible speaks about in John 5, 24, it will by definition last forever as we are sealed by the Holy Ghost unto the day of redemption, Ephesians 4, 30. So these are some of the key verses that I'm just quickly taking you through that people, you know, will give to people when we're out preaching the gospel. And then number five, we get to the heart of the matter, which is the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross, also called the vicarious punishment sometimes, um, as, in, as in the fact that Jesus acted in the place of another or stood in the place of someone else, as in Jesus died for us. So basically the substitution means that instead of us receiving God's wrath, Jesus took God's wrath upon himself. And once we get people to understand and acknowledge that they are sinners, that even telling a single lie will bar the way to heaven forever, according to Revelation 21, 27, we explain that Jesus took their sins on himself along with the sins of the whole world, which is explained in John 3, 16, was crucified, died, was buried, and because death could not hold him down, since he is God, and by nature of his Godhead is eternal, he won the victory over death and hell and rose again on the third day, which is explained in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, and verse 55. So again, just very quickly taking you through it, Acts 2.24 also says, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. God, being infinite by nature, could pay the penalty for all mankind without being himself killed or destroyed. But the question is this, how does Jesus Christ, dying on the cross and rising again from the dead, save anybody from their sins? What is the connection between the death of Christ and the eternal salvation of the soul. And I'll sometimes stop there when I'm preaching the gospel and I'll ask people, do you know why Christ died for your sins? Do you know why one man dying on the cross, even if he is God, saves you from everlasting punishment in hell? Does, how does the death of one man assuage God's wrath? What does the single self-sacrificial act of love have to do with your eternal salvation? How does that clear you of your guilt before a just and almighty God? So we were out preaching the gospel this week and met an inquisitive young man who wanted to know the answer to these very questions. And the crux of the message that we presented to him had to do with the fact that Jesus took his place. We explained to him the substitutionary atonement that if he would just believe and receive that substitutionary atonement, that he would be saved. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened 
by the Spirit. That's a parallel of 2 Corinthians 5.21, which I began this sermon with, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we also see the same concept in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, a prophecy about Jesus in verses 5 through 6, uh, beginning in 5 through 6. But he was wounded for our, right, for our transgressions, speaking of the Messiah that was to come, it was foretold. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. See, we can only have peace with God by Christ himself taking upon him our chastisement, our punishment for sins. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. See, all men have sinned. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So Christ became the sin bearer on our behalf and made intercession to us before God, the Father, the just judge of the universe. You see, God is just. He must punish sin in order to uphold his own standard of morality. But Jesus took our penal, vicarious substitution and interceded on our behalf. 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God... And one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And so he had to, Jesus had to stand in our place and mediate and intercede on our behalf before a perfect God. And only by his suffering on the cross on our behalf were we able to stand, will we be able to stand before God. And we run across people when soul winning who don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want to hear about Jesus. Or who, after hearing the gospel, still believe that they will be okay after they die, even without Christ. They believe that they're a good person. Um, you know, or maybe they think that God would never send anyone to hell for all eternity. They think God wouldn't ever do that, you know, and that they're good and they're going to they're be okay as long as they're generally living a good life. Others believe that nothing happens after we die that we simply cease to exist and that there is no immortal soul or spirit <coughs> or spirit or consciousness after death. <clears throat> so we run across all kinds of people with different views when we're out preaching the gospel. <clears throat> but their false and limited view of reality does not change God's sense of justice and his decreed order in his creation, in his universe, which he established by his foreknowledge. And I tell people that Hebrews 9.27 states that there is a judgment after we die. And we must make that decision in this lifetime. Everybody is going to be judged by God when we die. And you can't choose Jesus Christ after you die. It'll be too late. It has to be chosen. He has to be chosen now in this life before we get to that judgment. Hebrews 9.27 says, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And this is where the substitutionary atonement matters. This is where it gets real before God. We get to the judgment of God, and if we have Christ standing in our place as our substitute, as our Savior, God will look at us and he will not see us. He will not see our works or our sins, but the work that Jesus did and his righteousness. And so Jesus Christ stands in our place where we would be standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ himself will be standing in our place. And it's, it's really a beautiful thing when you think about it. God doesn't see me when I'm being judged if I have Christ as my Savior, he sees his own son standing where I ought to stand, interceding on my behalf. But when the non-believer, the person who rejects Jesus Christ, the person who doesn't believe in God through Jesus Christ alone, when the non-believer gets to the judgment and faces a holy and a just God, he has to face God alone. 
He has to face God on his own merit alone. Jesus is not standing in the place of the non-believer. Jesus is not standing there and interceding on his behalf. Jesus is not his savior and his substitute. The natural man apart from Christ stands alone under the curse of the law before a holy God. And so God looks at the man and judges him based on what he did. That man who hasn't taken Christ will be judged. And because the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, 9, and because we are all as an unclean thing in all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6, every man will fail the judgment and have the way barred to him from the kingdom of heaven. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. It's like if you're standing before a secular judge and you're up for charges of embezzlement or murder or you know, you've stolen something, whatever the charges might be, and you say, look, well, I did all these other great things, you know, before I committed this act of embezzlement. You know, I fed the poor, I paid my taxes, I'm a good father, I give to charity. I'm generally good, is what they'll say, but they just stole something or they just murdered someone, you know. And that judge won't look at all his good works. They won't, he won't look at all the good things that he did. He'll see the, the charges that are brought up against him and that man will be found guilty. So in other words, your good works aren't going to outweigh your bad deeds on this life. It's not like, you know, you do some good things, you do some bad things, and God is going to let you in. That's not how it works. If you do one bad thing, God says, no, you can't come in into the kingdom of heaven. That's why Jesus has to take our penalty for our sins as God made flesh. And so, you know, we have to remember also that God's standards are up here and we're down here, no matter how good we think we are. They're much higher. His standards are much higher than that secular, wicked judge. And so even telling a single lie will bar you from heaven. Revelation 20, starting at verse 11, describes the judgment of the unbeliever who does not have Christ standing in his place. Take a look at Revelation 20, starting at verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. What a marvelous sight of, you know, everything was, was heaven and earth were fleeing away from the presence and glory of God, because even, even the creation itself can't bear up to the holiness of God. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Notice that the unbeliever is going to be judged according to their works. That's, that's going to be the judgment. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. Now notice that the unbeliever was already in hell, was already dead. It's just that now he was going to be judged for his wicked works. And so we see that the great white throne judgment is the, the judgment of the unbeliever who does not put his faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And, whatso, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, you know, notice that everybody who gets judged at the white throne judgment ends up in the lake of fire because they're going to be judged based on what they did. So if we, if we are standing before God, we better make sure that we have Jesus Christ with us or we're going to end up in the lake of fire. And um, the thing is, though, various false teachings have risen up. That's a substitutionary atonement, but various false teachings have risen up around the biblical version of the substitutionary atonement, including what I mentioned earlier, the ransom theory, 
which originated among so-called believers like Origen of Alexandria in the third century. But we know that Origen was hands down a heretic of heretics. He was the father of heretics because if you know anything about Origen, I mention him from time to time, he is the origin of numerous heresies in existence today. He's behind nearly every one of them to some degree. Origen's heresies include the subordination of the Son to the Father and the subordination of the Holy Spirit to the Son. He believed that each was lesser than the other, that the Holy Spirit, in his own words, he says that the Holy Spirit was not an equal value to the Son and that the Son was not an equal value to the Father. And so Origen did not believe that the three persons of the Trinity are co-equal within the Godhead. Origen believed also in the pre-existence of the human soul, which Mormons today believe. Origen was a universalist, the belief that all will be saved. And he even believed that the devil would eventually be saved. This is all from his own writings um, that, that he has. He's written something like 6,000 different uh, works. And so we get this from his, from his writings. In other words, Origen wasn't even saved. You know, you can't be saved and be this confused about so many fundamental doctrines of the faith. Of the faith. He was a false teacher of great magnitude. Now, Origen is also in many ways responsible for promoting the corrupt manuscripts which led to the modern Bible versions, such as the Codex Sinaiticus. And Origen didn't even believe in the literal 24-hour, six-day creation. So, it's just, it sounds like, I mean, this guy was an early antichrist, if you think about it. Probably one of the, the first among the early church that we know about historically. And Origen was actually the author, perhaps the first person to postulate the ransom to the devil theory of substitutionary atonement. The ransom theory was also held by popular theologian and writer C.S. Lewis, as well as Eastern Orthodoxy. And so there's this false view out there that the substitutionary atonement to which we hold today, sometimes called the penal substitution, was invented not by the early believers, not by um, the, the Bible. It didn't come from the Bible. They say Origen didn't hold to it, so the early church fathers didn't hold to it, even though he wasn't an early church father. They say that this doctrine of the substitution arose out of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. That's the claim. Now, um, the, the reformers did come up with what they called the system of theology called the penal substitutionary atonement. And I, you know, I understand what that term means, but I don't like to use it theologically because it's been associated with the reformed Calvinist view which denies men's free will. But in the true sense of the word penal means enacting punishment for breaking a law. Penal and penalty have the same root word. It's a legal term, meaning that the judicial aspect of God's law was fulfilled in that substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. And so because Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, he became our penal substitution. So in the fundamental sense of that word, we do believe in the, in the penal substitutionary atonement minus the Calvinism versus the ransom theory, which was uh, postulated by Origen. And the reason that people have this strange view of you know, where these doctrines came from is because Martin Luther and the reformers uh, said, let me, let me give you a quote by Martin Luther. He said, Therefore, Christ was not only crucified and died, and I, by the way, I agree with Martin Luther on this point, so it's, it's actually a good quote. Um, Therefore, Christ was not only crucified and died, but by divine love, sin was laid upon him. He has and bears all the sins of all men in his body, not in the sense that he has committed them, but in the sense that he took these sins committed by us upon his own body in order to make satisfaction for them with his own blood. 
putting off his innocence and holiness and putting on your sinful person, he bore our sin, death and curse. He became a sacrifice and a curse for you in order thus to set you free from the curse of the law. So that is good doctrine. I agree with Martin Luther on that point by itself. If you just take those words and isolate them, it's true. But while Luther and the reformers rediscovered and understood a tru this truth and explained it at the risk of death against the spiritual forces at work in high places within the Roman Catholic system, that's not to say that they were the only ones to understand this at that time or that they are the authors of this doctrine. There were other believers outside the dichotomy that existed between the Roman Catholic and the Protestant debate. And the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement comes from not Luther, not Origen, not anyone else, but God himself and is found in the pages of scripture. Now, the fact that Jesus was a ransom for us is not in dispute because the Bible says in Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's not in dispute. The Bible calls Jesus a ransom. What is in dispute is to whom the ransom was being paid. Those who believe the so-called ransom theory of atonement believe that the death of Jesus Christ was a ransom paid to the devil. Their claim is that man forfeited his soul to, to Satan at the fall, and so God handed Jesus over to Satan in exchange for the souls of mankind. But this is absolute heresy. Satan has no part whatsoever in the redemptive work of mankind. There is nothing in scripture to support the ransom theory to the devil. If anything, Satan was condemned for his participatory role in the fall of man. Satan will be punished for that role, not rewarded with the souls of men. Genesis 3.14 says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So this idea that Satan rules over hell and the souls of men is fiction. It's not found anywhere in the Bible. You get this from literature and, and popular fiction or movies or cartoons, you know, but you don't get that from the Bible. Satan himself will be punished for all eternity alongside the unbelieving. Revelation 20.10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Does that sound like in any way that he's ruling or reigning over the souls of men or over anything at all? So the ransom theory is false. God owns the soul of all men, and it will be God who will punish the souls of the unbeliever in hell who don't put their faith in Jesus Christ. Psalm 49, 6 through 8 proves this. Psalm 49, starting at verse 6, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever. So again, we see here the redemption of the soul, the ransom being paid is associated with God, not with the devil. We see that the Bible teaches that um, Satan doesn't own men, but God does. Ephesians 5.2 also destroys the ransom to the devil theory as it's very direct on this point about who that ransom was being paid to. So Ephesians 5, 2 says, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, there's the atonement, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So very clear, plain words, that sacrifice of Jesus was to God, not to the devil. God had to be assuaged. God's wrath had to be, had to be assuaged and paid for. Um, it was God that had to be appeased because of the curse 
of the law which abided on us. So uh, we see this also in the Old Testament passages like Numbers 29.2, which that's just one example is Numbers 29.2. There's numerous passages where Jesus or the Messiah or the offering is mentioned as a sacrifice to God. So Numbers 29.2, and ye shall offer a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto the Lord. So again, unto the Lord, that sweet savor, one young bullock, one ram, and seven lambs of the first year without blemish. And I've, I've mentioned this before in past sermons, but Ephesians 5.2, Jesus is called a sacrifice to God and a sweet-smelling savor, referring back to the sacrifices as a sweet savor unto the Lord. So you really can't get any clearer than that. Um, the substitutionary atonement is even foreshadowed by Abraham, offering his only son Isaac as a burnt offering to God when God tested Abraham. Look at Genesis 22, starting at verse 10. The Bible reads, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So God was testing Abraham, and he said, Bring your son Isaac to me and burn him as an offering to me. And verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God. So it was just a test. Seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Notice the parallel of only son. This was foreshadowing God's only son, Jesus Christ. Number uh, verse 13, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. So we see that the sacrifice was being made to God, first of all, not to the devil. And we see that God provided a substitute for Isaac by making himself, by himself, providing a ram in his stead, which that ram represented was symbolic of Jesus. That ram was Jesus Christ. That ram represented him, uh, you know, spiritually. As men, we don't owe Satan anything. It is God's law which we have broken, not the devil's. Colossians 1, 21 through 22 affirms this. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now have he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Not in the devil's sight, but in his sight. We will be unblameable and unreprovable. Second Corinthians 5.19 says, To which that God was in Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not unto the devil, not imputing their trespasses unto them. That's a substitutionary work. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. It's all about reconciling the sinner to God. And only Jesus could stand as the intercession between man who's sinful and God. We have to have Jesus or we cannot get to God by ourself or apart from you know, we can't go directly to God. We need that perfect, that perfect substitution between God and man. Jesus, therefore, was the only suitable ransom or sacrifice, himself being perfect and having all sufficiency in himself to die for the sins of the whole world. No one else has the qualifications to satisfy God's law but God himself. And that's where propitiation comes in, which means to appease the wrath of someone. In this case, appeasing the wrath of God, which means to make God, to make him propitious or graceful towards our sinful condition and towards us. That's what the word propitiation means. So we be, Jesus becomes the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 2, 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Calvinism debunked in a million verses, you know, 
Jesus died for the whole world. 1 John 4.10, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He appeased God's, you know, the, the penalty that we would have faced. He appeased God's law, the, ju- the judicial aspect of God's law. Romans 4.25 says that he, Jesus, was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So Jesus rose again after death because death could not hold Jesus because he was God. But the substitutionary atonement, which the Bible states, uh, which the Bible teaches, states that Christ's sacrifice frees man from the judicial demands of justice found within the law, thus satisfying the righteousness of the law of God and the holiness of God himself. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Of course, the tree, the cross was made out of a tree, which is why it's called that in in Galatians 3.13, being made of wood. But people sometimes wonder, and this is one of the questions that that inquisitive young man that I mentioned earlier uh, had for us when we were preaching the gospel. He said, how does Jesus suffering for three days equal the price that all mankind would have to pay in eternity uh, in hell for all time? In other words, Jesus didn't suffer for all eternity, but only for three days. So how is that justice? How does that work? And so how does that equate to the eternal punishment in hell that, that unbelievers will face? Well, the answer, it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind uh, around, but the perfect God in the form of a perfect man paid the perfect and all-sufficient payment for all sin once and for all. Finite men are required to pay an infinite price for offending an infinite and eternal God. But because Jesus is God, and therefore by nature himself eternal, he was able to make a one-time finite payment to cover our infinite offenses. It has to do with his eternal nature. God is eternal. He's God. That makes him the perfect uh, satisfactory sacrifice, all sufficient you know, to, to wrong all, to right all wrongs. His eternal nature surpasses everything, including death itself, and thereby he claims the victory by his eternity. Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by one offering, by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10, 17 through 18 says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Just one time, Jesus had to die. And that covered everyone forever. Jesus had to only die once. It comes down to this. When you die and you get to the judgment, you're going to face God. Everyone is going to face God. Are you going to boast in your own works and say that you were a good person and that God should just let you in? We know that none of us are really good, right? Or are you going to say that Jesus, the perfect Son of God, stood in your place at the judgment, took your sins, put it on himself, went up onto the cross, died, rose again because he was God and death could not hold him down. God became man. He's God. He can do that. It's not hard for God to take on the flesh and to become man. So what are you going to say when you get there? You know, when you get to the judgment, are you going to appeal to yourself and say, I'm good, let me in? Or are you going to appeal to God's sacrifice? Now, the vast majority of the world's false religions teach that you have to be a good person to get to heaven. That's what most religions teach. But Christianity is different. It says that you can't be a good person. That God is only good. No one else is good. That if, you have, that if you behave morally and are a good person, that you will go to heaven. That's what they teach. And it's actually true that if you, if you are a good person, you will go to heaven. But who's good? You know, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's the story of a man in the Bible who thought he was good. 
And we'll just end with uh, this passage and maybe think one more. But Mark 10, 17 through 22. A man came to Jesus in the Bible and he thought he was good. Starting in Mark 10, uh, verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeling to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? He wanted to know how to get to heaven. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. By saying this, Jesus was saying that he is God. Because only he was perfect. Only he lived without sin. And that at the same time, he was also affirming the fact that nobody else is good but God. That humans are not good. Verse 19, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. Jesus was telling him that to inherit eternal life... All he has to do is follow the commands perfectly. Be good. That's all you have to do is be perfect and you can go to heaven is basically what Jesus was saying. Of course, he was trying to show the man that nobody can do it apart from, you know, Christ himself. Verse 20, and he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. But Jesus shows him otherwise. You see, this man had not observed the law perfectly from his youth. That was a lie, or he had deceived himself. Jesus was about to show him that the man was covetous of material gain, of material possessions. Verse 21, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross, and follow me. And the young man, it says, and he was sad at that saying, or the man, I don't know if he was young, but, and he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. So he was unable, he was covetous of his possessions. He had not kept the law of God perfectly. So there are two ways to get to heaven. Number one, be perfect and live a sinless life. Are you able to be perfect? Is that possible? It's not possible. Number two, the only other way, the second way to get to heaven, is admit that you're a sinner, that we all do bad things, and that it's impossible to live a perfect and sinless life, and receive Jesus, God made flesh, as your substitute instead of you. Jesus will be judged instead of you, and Jesus is perfect. So is Jesus Christ your substitute today? Is Jesus Christ your Savior Or will you stand on the merits of your own work before a holy and righteous God? The choice is yours, and you only have this lifetime to make it. Hebrews 9.27, final verse. Hebrews 9.27 through 28. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. We're all going to face God. Verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. To bear means to take upon himself the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Christ is our only salvation. Jesus is the only way to heaven. There is no other way unless you can be perfect. So let's just bow our heads and say a word of prayer and we'll end the service uh, with this. We thank you, Father, We praise your holy name. Thank you for your perfect word and your perfect sacrifice. Thank you that the word became flesh and died on our behalf, taking upon himself the penalty of our sins and that only he could do it. Only he was sufficient to stand in our place. We thank you and we praise you. Let us put our faith in Jesus Christ for salvation so that we may all be in heaven rejoicing with you. In Jesus' name, amen.